The electric guitar is the definitive instrument of rock and roll, and Eddie Van Halen is one of the few players who can claim to be among the greatest of all time. This is the untold truth of Eddie Van Halen. Van Halen was the biggest hard rock band since KISS. According to Edward Van Halen, a definitive biography, KISS co-leader Gene Simmons was scouting talent for Casablanca Records in 1976 when he discovered Van Halen playing a show in West Hollywood. Simmons liked the group and booked them some studio time to record demos of 12 songs, and then flew the guys to New York City for overdubs at Jimi Hendrix's Electric Lady Studios and to play at a showcase for KISS's manager, Bill O'Coin. He declined to take on Van Halen as clients, but after the band returned to California, Simmons recruited Eddie Van Halen and his brother drummer Alex Van Halen to demo songs for the next KISS album, Love Gun. When KISS's actual guitarist Ace Frehley was tasked with recording the song Christine 16, his solo was a note-by-note -note recreation of Eddie Van Halen's attempt. A few years later, around 1982, Eddie was so tired of clashing with singer David Lee Roth that he attempted to join KISS who were then in the process of splitting with guitarist Ace Freely. Simmons told Guitar World, Eddie said, I want to join KISS. I don't want to fight anymore with Roth. I told him, Eddie, there's not enough room. You need to be in a band where you can direct the music. In his early years, Eddie Van Halen learned the ropes of the touring musician's life from his father Jan, the Dutch jazz woodwind player. Van Halen told Esquire, When I started playing in front of people, I'd get so damn nervous. I asked him, Dad? How do you do it? That's when he handed me the cigarette and the drink. And I go, oh, this is good. It works. The booze relaxed Van Halen, albeit at tremendous cost. He struggled with alcohol abuse for decades, telling Billboard, quote, I got drunk before I'd show up to high school, adding that vodka became his tipple of choice at the recommendation of his science teacher. In 1988, after the alcohol-related death of his father, Van Halen told Rolling Stone that he'd quit drinking, but the sobriety didn't stick. He eventually started drinking heavily again, and in 2007, he checked himself into rehab, which made him miss Van Halen's induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Eddie Van Halen completely reinvented the way his instrument could be played, crafting a one-of-a-kind sound that would influence hard rock contemporaries and successors alike. According to Rolling Stone, Van Halen devised a rock guitar playing method called finger tapping, in which he played the guitar's fretboard like a piano, with two hands rather than finding notes with one set of fingers and strumming with the other. The result, as heard on songs like Eruption, unrivaled speed, precision, a wider freedom in terms of available notes, and just all around totally metal shredding. It was so unconventional that his brother, drummer Alex Van Halen, advised him during early gigs to play with his back to the audience so nobody would steal his moves. If Van Halen couldn't get the exact sound he wanted out of a particular guitar, he'd alter the instrument with saws and sandpaper. Van Halen's most famous guitar was known as Frankenstein, or Frankenstrat, and the musician built it himself out of a $50 body and an $80 neck. The piece is so famous that a replica currently resides in the Smithsonian. Some people call it Frankenstein. I call it my baby. The only act with popularity that could rival Van Halen's in the mid-1980s was Michael Jackson. He dominated pop music with Thriller a mega hit that went on to sell at least 66 million copies. There was a little something for everyone on Thriller, the soft pop of human nature, the funky post-disco of Billie Jean, and even hard rock with Beat It. The latter's centerpiece, a speedy, mind-blowing electric guitar solo that couldn't have come from anybody besides Eddie Van Halen. And to think, he almost didn't even do it. Producer Quincy Jones asked Van Halen to come into the studio, though no specific recording project was agreed upon at first. While Jackson stepped out briefly to record another song, Van Halen listened to a rough cut of Beat It, offered some arrangement tips, and laid down two improvised guitar solos. It all took about 30 minutes. And then Michael came in and I said, oh, I hope you don't mind, I changed your song. And he listens and he goes, no, I, I really like that high fast stuff you do. <laughs> Van Halen didn't accept payment, doing it as a favor to Jones, and initially refused credit too. But word leaked out when Beat It hit number one on the pop chart. In 1985, when Van Halen was at its commercial peak thanks to the multi-platinum success of the album 1984, over-the-top lead singer David Lee Roth left the group to pursue a solo career. Van Halen wasn't ready to split up, and desperately sought out a singer, any singer, that could replace the inimitable Roth. And though the band would eventually go with Sammy Hagar, Van Halen's initial shortlist of candidates was provocative, 
Singer Patti Smythe of the band Scandal told Delaware's News Journal in 2014, Eddie asked me to join Van Halen, but they asked me not to talk about it in interviews at the time because they didn't want Sammy Hagar to feel like he was the second choice. Another musician Eddie Van Halen purportedly heavily pursued was pop crooner Daryl Hall of the mega-successful Hall & Notes. When Hagar guested on Hall's Live from Daryl's house, he asked Hall about the rumor. Hall confirmed that it happened and that he passed. Eddie Van Halen started developing serious health issues in the mid-1990s. He nicknamed Van Halen's tour supporting the album Balance the Ambulance Tour because he played through intense hip pain and after delaying replacement surgery for years, finally underwent the procedure in 1999. According to USA Today, Van Halen got a bionic hip because of bone death in the femoral ball part of the hip. Van Halen was also a longtime chain smoker, although in 2015 he switched to vaping. Unfortunately, cancer was found in his mouth in 2000, and a third of his tongue was surgically removed that same year, according to TMZ. The cancer spread to his throat, and while he received a clean bill of health in 2002, he reportedly commuted to Germany for special treatments for years. Interestingly, Van Halen didn't blame his cancer on his years of smoking, telling Billboard, I used metal picks, they're brass and copper, which I always held in my mouth, in the exact place where I got the tongue cancer. Plus, I basically live in a recording studio that's filled with electromagnetic energy. According to TMZ, in 2020 Van Halen's condition took a turn for the worse. The cancer had returned and spread to his brain. On October 6th, Eddie Van Halen died at St. John's Hospital in Santa Monica, California. His wife, brother Alex, and son Wolfgang at his bedside. The guitar hero was 65. Crikey, it's the untold truth of Steve Irwin. From the time he saved his friend from an angry croc to the freak accident that led to his death, here's everything you wanted to know about the legendary crocodile hunter. Good day. The usual disclaimer clearly states that people shouldn't try this at home unless they happen to be a professional. At the very least, Steve Irwin had some serious cred from a very, very young age. According to his obituary in The Guardian, he kicked off his snake handling career in earnest at the remarkably tender age of six, back when he was given a 12-foot scrub python as a pet. He named his pet snake Fred. Don't ask us why. Now see how he's ooh, opening up his mouth and he's got his... Hang on, hang on. No biting now. Irwin told Reptiles magazine that he started catching snakes when he was about four years old, and he reportedly captured his very first brown snake simply by putting his foot down on it. Dad came over and decked me out of the way. It's the second most venomous snake in the world. Under his father's watchful eye, Irwin reportedly jumped on the back of his first crocodile at the equally tender age of nine. Talk about a natural. Obviously, his dad did something right because Irwin somehow managed to make it to adulthood, thank the heavens. In 2004, Larry King got Irwin to open up about some of his biggest and scariest close calls. Irwin told a harrowing tale that involved his best friend Wes and a massive crocodile named Graham. Croc hunter Steve Irwin says his colleague was lucky not to have lost his leg. Apparently, Graham had bitten Irwin once before on the hand, back when he and Wes were tasked with shoring up the reptile's enclosure during a flood. Wes and I met up when he was a teenager, and between us, we've wrestled and wrangled and tossed more crocs than you could poke a stick at. Clearly, the crocodile didn't appreciate the intrusion, especially since he was sharing the enclosure with his crocodile girlfriend, Bindi. Ah, she's so shy. Irwin told King, Graham snuck up on Wes, grabbed him right by the bottom and just started killing him right in front of me. Irwin said he immediately hopped onto the croc, grabbed his back leg, and twisted with all his might. Graham finally dropped his friend and the men headed straight to the hospital, where Wes got stitched up and put back together. Oh, and Graham? Well, they almost lost him, too, to food poisoning. Somehow, we're trying to feel really bad about Graham's food poisoning, but it's not working. Maybe it just hasn't hit us yet. Irwin spent his entire life working with some of the most dangerous animals in the world. Nearly killed both of us. Son of a gun. So when he was killed by a stingray, the world's collective response was, seriously? It shocked us all that his life would be taken by a relatively docile creature. The media called it a freak accident, but just how freaky was it? Well, when you stop to break it down, it was actually pretty darn freaky. 
According to Slate, there aren't solid numbers on how many people have actually been killed by stingrays, but estimates range between 17 and 30 incidents worldwide. Not per year, mind you. There are only about 17 to 30 stingray deaths recorded by humans ever. There have likely been a few more deaths, but these incidents aren't tracked particularly well. The Atlantic says Irwin was the first Australian to have a deadly encounter with a stingray in 60 years. Science Line studied exactly how dangerous stingrays are. For one thing, they're massive creatures. They can grow up to 14 feet long and weigh in at a whopping 750 pounds. Also, they're venomous, but they don't tend to be particularly hostile. There are around 1,500 stingray-related incidents every year in the United States, but most of those injuries involve discomfort. Certainly not death. Unless, of course, you're trained and well-practiced, you should always give venomous creatures a wide berth. What we're trying to say is, just keep away from stingrays, okay? Get out, guys! Happy Steve Allen Day from Australia Zoo! Did you know November 15th is officially Steve Irwin Day? According to Huffington Post Australia, the date was chosen because it was the birthday of one of the Australia Zoo's most legendary residents, a Galapagos tortoise named Harriet. She lived to be 175, and Steve's wife, Terry Irwin, revealed the choice was made in honor of their special relationship and to make sure Steve Irwin Day is all about wildlife and wild places. Of course, the biggest and baddest of Steve Irwin Day celebrations takes place at the family's Australia Zoo, where guests get to feed the crocs, eat a huge breakfast, listen to live music, and enjoy a number of, quote, conservation conversations. I just wanted to say hello and wish everyone a wonderful day today for Steve Irwin Day. If you're wondering if there's anything you can do to observe Irwin's special day, there is. Khaki it. And remember, as they say in Oz, to khaki it. Or as we say in America, khaki. They say wearing Irwin's trademark khakis can open up a conversation about conservation and wildlife. And that's exactly the legacy Steve Irwin would have wanted. Professor Croc Hunter? Go ahead and call us crazy, but we totally take that class in a heartbeat. Oh my God. In 2007, Australian Broadcasting Corporation reported that Terry Irwin had accepted an honorary professorship on her late husband's behalf. The posthumous award was given by the University of Queensland, but tragically, Steve died before he ever found out the university had decided to make him a professor. The honorary position recognized all of the conservation work that Steve spent the better part of his life performing. It also paid tribute to his partnership with the university and its ongoing project to tag and track adult crocodiles. Come on, big buddy. Come on, big fella. Come on. Here he goes. Steve wasn't the only family member honored by the university. In 2015, Terry was also given an honorary doctorate for her continued work in conservation and education. Some Australians evidently took issue with Steve Irwin's persona. Of course, many of his fellow countrymen viewed his untimely death with tremendous shock and grief, but some Australians thought Irwin was less of a crusader and more of a stereotype. In many regards, he perfectly embodied how many people envision Australians down-to-earth, capable of surviving the wildest terrain, and fond of saying things like crikey and g'day all the time. On the other hand, he was so over the top that plenty of Aussies wanted to distance themselves from what they thought was an unfortunate stereotype. So as you're either sitting in your chair like this going, my, my goodness, or you're on, you know, going like this, watching the telly. Irwin was totally aware of his reputation, too. After his death, Australian Broadcasting Corporation quoted him as having once said, Back here in my own country, some people find me a bit embarrassing. The kind of cringe, you know? Meanwhile, it was definitely a very different story in the USA. Crikey, it's phenomenal in America. Phenomenal. It's just, I'm a rock star. In 2004, Steve Irwin sent the world into a tizzy when footage surfaced that featured him feeding a crocodile in front of onlookers, all while holding his one-month-old son Robert in the other arm. Now, TV's uh, crocodile hunter took his, what, 10, 12-pound, one-month-old baby boy and held it very close, within feet of a hungry crocodile. I think he was just being silly. According to the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, the incident occurred during a show at Irwin's Queensland Zoo, and the Queensland police reportedly received loads of complaints. Plenty of critics crawled out of the woodwork to claim that Irwin was basically an irresponsible parent. It seems in the name of entertainment or showbiz to put your child at risk was a, a fairly foolish thing to do. 
Meanwhile, Irwin completely disagreed with his critics. He told Australian Broadcasting Corporation that he would, quote, probably do things a little differently if he could turn back time. But he also said he wasn't sorry about the stunt. I would be considered a bad parent if I didn't teach my children to be crocodile savvy. That said, the public outcry definitely upset him. And the thing that has hurt me the most is that people would perceive what I do as dangerous. With all of his relentless enthusiasm, it would be rather easy to dismiss Steve Irwin as a tireless showman who just wanted attention, and lots of it. A python from a... Um, you might have to cut him, he's biting my neck. He was hugely polarizing even within the wildlife conservation and education community. But a lot of people never really knew too much about the tremendous amounts of valuable work he did off camera. Have a look at this little blighter. Crikey, as fat as mud. Through a partnership with researchers from the University of Queensland, Irwin helped trap and tag crocodiles so that their movements could be monitored. According to the Smithsonian, that program has unearthed some pretty awesome info about crocodiles over the years. How far their territories reach, how deep they can dive, and how they often live in groups with a really rather complicated social hierarchy. The kindest and safest way to control a croc is to get as many people as you can to sit on him. In 2004, Irwin and the university launched a new program graced with the superior name Crocs in Space. The program outfitted saltwater crocodiles with remote trackers that were monitored from satellites, and we've learned some seriously remarkable stuff from the programs Irwin supported and helped fund. Did you know a non-dominant male crocodile can travel hundreds of miles, or that they can hold their breath for around seven hours? At the end of the day, crocodiles are ridiculously cool animals, and we didn't know any of this before Irwin and his family got involved. Sure, his methods were occasionally controversial, but you can't argue about whether or not Steve Irwin's heart was in the right place. Oh man, they are so cute. You just want to hug them and kiss on them and squeeze their little hairy face. That's why it's frankly a little bit strange that he outright refused to become a vegetarian. Sounds odd at first, but listen to his reasoning. Irwin told Scientific American that he studied vegetarianism and decided it just wasn't feasible. He used a purely speculative cow to make his point, a cow that would keep him supplied with a belly full of nutritious meat for a month. While the cow was being raised, she could share her little patches of paradise with trees, plants, and other little critters, while the land around her could be home to all kinds of other animals. Irwin explained that if he was a vegetarian, he'd need a heck of a lot more land dedicated to only feeding him. Nothing else can grow there. If we leveled that much land to grow rice and whatever, then no other animal could live there except for some insect pest species. Makes sense, doesn't it? Irwin preached conservation and education, and of course we can all get behind that. When Scientific American asked Irwin what he thought about areas of the world like Indonesia, places where habitat destruction wasn't going to be stopped anytime soon, he had a solution for the problem. He called it Time Capsule Endangered Animals. Yes! The biggest and grandest arrivals of Australia Zoo's history is happening right now. Essentially, Irwin wanted to take endangered animal populations out of the wild and place them in zoos. There, they'd be protected from wholesale slaughter or the slow death that goes along with habitat destruction. Meanwhile, researchers would learn everything they could, set up habitats for them in captivity, and breed them. Once habitat destruction, deforestation, and other threats to survival were reversed, they could be reintroduced to the wild and the species would be rebuilt. Irwin believed that's how zoos should ultimately be utilized, and he was hugely in favor of zoos taking responsibility for all the animals in their particular region. He told Scientific American, We have to be educational facilities with the ability to put animals back in the wild when the critical stage is over. Irwin's love of animals, particularly the creepy crawly variety, isn't as unlikely as it seems when you consider his highly unusual upbringing. He told Reptiles Magazine that his love for wildlife started with his father Bob and his mother Lynn, who was a wildlife rehabilitator. As Irwin told Andrew Denton, And mum was a maternity nurse who actually um, wanted to follow her passion, which was um, joey kangaroos and koalas and wombats and platypus, yeah. raising them. Irwin spent his life around animals, and in 1970, the family founded the Birwa Reptile Park that later grew into Steve's legacy, Australia Zoo. While Steve's mom taught him all about rehabilitation techniques and introducing animals back into the wild, his father was teaching him how to jump on crocodiles. Wonder how that went over with mom. Just be very, very careful. Woo! Yes! 
Get right into it, babe. Get right into it. I'm really scared. That's okay. When the family finally founded the Birwa Reptile Park, they also started working with the East Coast Crocodile Management Program. According to Britannica's Advocacy for Animals, the goal was to capture crocodiles that had gotten too close to populated areas and relocate them somewhere that was safer for everyone involved. Irwin regularly went out with his father on catch-and-release missions. By the 1980s, he was doing it on his own. And in he goes, back into his deep, dark, dirty water. There are lots of different orders within the Catholic Church, and they have slightly different rules for how to be a nun. But while traditions, ceremonies, and rules of conduct may differ from order to order or convent to convent, there are some rules that almost all nuns have to follow. One of the most important things to note is the often confused difference between a sister and a nun, which is especially confusing thanks to the fact that nuns refer to each other by the title sister. According to Simply Catholic, though, a sister deals with outreach. They might work in healthcare or do community work like at soup kitchens, that type of thing. Or they may have more typical sounding jobs like working at a non-profit liturgical printing press, for instance. Either way, sisters usually live in a convent, a sisters-based residence that might contain a chapel, individual rooms, and so on, and leave when necessary. A nun, on the other hand, lives in a monastery and pretty much never leaves. These nuns live lives that are separate from the world, dedicated to meditation and consecrated to God. If you envision a Buddhist monk or any other cross-cultural, universal idea of an isolated hermetic individual dedicating their lives to quiet study, introspection, and a focus away from all things secular, then you've got a good baseline from which to work to understand the rules nuns have to follow. In the case of nuns, they also believe they serve a spiritual function, using their prayers as a constant entreaty and intercession to the divine on behalf of humanity. A modern nun's overall basic schedule isn't too different from what it would have been hundreds of years ago. Get up, pray, eat, pray, clean a bit, read, work, have some conversation, and so on. Every nun nowadays has to follow their orders and monastery's daily schedule. Some are stricter than others, and some are more outgoing. Outgoing enough that they have websites explaining to the world what exactly it is that they do. For instance, orders such as the Benedictines in Herefordshire, England, get up at 5 a.m., pray, eat, have free time, work in the garden, and so on. The Visitation Sisters of Philadelphia have a similar routine, starting the day at 5.30 a.m. and engage in similar activities, including arts and crafts projects and computer-based projects. The Carmelites of Colorado Springs likewise do a lot of sewing and domestic activities, as well as bookkeeping and community correspondence online. Interspersed within these schedules is the Liturgy of Hours, a series of prayers and services throughout the day, such as Laud's First Service or Compline Last Service. And of course, like the rest of us, they have to do regular chores, like washing the dishes or milking the cows. Every morning, I take my cup of coffee to my cow, and I squirt milk straight into the coffee. You can do that? You can do that, so yeah. The general attitude of the entire proceedings is reverent and internal, or as St. Paul called it in 1 Thessalonians, they quote, pray without ceasing. If you've ever heard the word mindfulness, remaining appreciative of the moment, one's life, the world's interconnectedness, then you've sort of got the idea. Though mindfulness as a practice itself is, of course, Buddhist in origin. That takes us to the big ticket items that most people know, which are universal for all nuns, the vows of chastity, poverty, and obedience. Nuns' vow of chastity gets a lot of attention. It's understandably difficult for most folks to accept and imagine, as sexual relationships are prohibited no matter how much desired. Still, nuns have a lot of other ways to express their love for their fellow human beings, such as community service, prayer, and devotional activities, and communing with the divine in a more universal way. The phrases married to Jesus or brides of Christ are often invoked in this case. A vow of poverty may be equally difficult to imagine in our capitalist world, but if you've ever felt swallowed by the emptiness of a consumerist life and the hollow, unending appropriation of meaningless goods, then the idea of living simply might sound appealing. And that's what it really is, not a vow of being destitute, but rather one of not engaging in excess. Pair down, dial it back. Own your own soap, of course, but detach yourself from material things in lieu of spiritual things, which is a sentiment shared by numerous other faiths as well. And finally, obedience. Obedience to what? Well, to a life lived in imitation of Jesus, of course. Of course, following all these rules isn't for everyone, but for those who decide on this particular life path, there is a sequence of steps that must be followed a multi-year application process to ensure that would-be nuns are serious about the whole thing. There are differences according to order, Benedictines versus Dominicans versus Passionists and so on. But according to Alutea, the overall structure is the same for everyone. Being an aspirant means that someone has formally approached an order and said that they want to join. They continue to live amid society for another year or two while doing outreach, projects, teaching, monitoring social media, whatever needs doing with their chosen community. 
A postulant has formally moved into the monastery, but she's not allowed to be called the sister and wears different clothing from nuns who have made their final steps. This is supposed to be a time of intense inward focus that lasts maybe six months. Sister, have you considered the seriousness of what you're doing? Yes. A novice has been officially accepted and can start classes and training, take vows, and possibly change her name. After this, there are ranks leading up to fully professed nun, and eventually mother superior who's in charge of a monastery. Some other rules nuns have to follow, as Kiwi Report says, keep on your habit, no luxury foods, and as of a 2016 papal instruction by Pope Francis, limit social media. Now that might be the hardest vow of all. Avengers Endgame put a ton of heroes and villains together on the big screen. But it doesn't even scratch the surface when it comes to the sheer volume of characters that exist in the Marvel Universe. Here are a few characters you didn't know once graced the pages of a Marvel comic. Sure, kids love toys, but turning a bunch of goofy robot action figures into an epic storyline? That's no walk in the park. Back in the 80s, Hasbro really wanted to develop a detailed background story for their 26 mutating robot toys, the Transformers, but didn't know where to start. So they went to Marvel for help. Yes, Marvel. Or to be precise, Marvel editor Bob Budiansky created most of the classic Transformers names, characters, and story elements that you know today. Once Budiansky's Transformers mythology was developed, Marvel then premiered all these robotic heroes and villains in their own Transformers comic series, where the Autobots were portrayed as heroes in the same universe as the Avengers. As early as the third issue, Optimus Prime, Gears, and company teamed up with Spider-Man. Cool as it might be to imagine the Autobots rolling out to battle Thanos, though, it was never meant to last. Hasbro still held the rights, Marvel eventually stopped putting out comics, and the two canons have mostly been separate ever since outside of occasional team-ups like the 2007 comic New Avengers Transformers. If you go poking through those old Marvel handbooks, you'll find Frankenstein-inspired characters all over the place. The Hulk is the obvious one, but there's also the Thing in Ultron. Strings, but now I'm free. And even the Punisher got Frankenstein at one point. However, the actual creature created by Mary Shelley in 1818 was also incorporated into the Marvel Universe. Marvel's take on Frankenstein's monster is actually far more faithful to the source material than the old Universal Studios flicks ever were. Marvel's creature is the same clever, tragic figure that Shelley first wrote about, unlike the Boris Karloff version, and this monster experiences all the same events depicted in the novel, right up until the end, of course, where he ends up running into a bunch of surviving Neanderthals in the Arctic Circle, getting stuck in an earthquake, and then being frozen in ice a la Captain America because… Marvel? These days, the creature usually calls himself Frank, and he has become a proper superhero, known for teaming up with fellow quirky outsiders like Howard the Duck and She-Hulk. When you hear the name Conan the Barbarian, you probably picture a shirtless Arnold Schwarzenegger in his prime chopping off heads. What is best in life? To crush your enemies, see them driven before you, and to hear the lamentation of their women. However, this ancient warrior didn't originate on film, but rather in a series of pulp stories by Robert E. Howard in the 1930s. Howard died in 1936, and Conan died with him, until the 1970s when Marvel Comics scooped up the old character's rights, transferred Howard's stories into comic book form, and made Conan the pop culture icon he is today. In fact, according to Sci-Fi, Marvel's influence on the 1982 Schwarzenegger film was so prevalent that at one point, the comics writer Roy Thomas even worked on the movie's screenplay. Lest you believe that Marvel merely publishes Conan comics separately from their main line, though, fear not. Thanks to some time travel shenanigans, Conan has met heroes like Ant-Man and Thor, and though the comics publisher lost the Conan rights for a few decades, they eventually got them back. These days, the Barbarian Warrior can now be found teaming up with anti-heroes like Wolverine, Venom, and Elektra. Whenever Conan the Barbarian comes up in conversation, his ally, Red Sonja, usually isn't far behind. Arnold Schwarzenegger even co-starred in the 1985 Red Sonja spin-off starring Brigitte Nielsen, and in recent years, big names ranging from Robert Rodriguez to Amber Tamblyn have struggled to get a reboot off the ground. At one point, Rose McGowan was even set to play the role of everyone's favorite she-devil with a sword. Funny thing, though, Red Sonja wasn't part of Robert E. Howard's pulp stories. She's a Marvel Comics creation. 
Red Sonja first appeared in the 1973 comic Conan the Barbarian No. 23 by Roy Thomas and Barry Windsor Smith, and she was created mainly because Howard's original tales didn't have anything in the way of strong and or developed female characters. Proving to be almost as popular as Conan, Red Sonja earned her own solo comic along with that aforementioned feature film, and she eventually teamed up with Spider-Man 2. Bizarrely enough, Sonya's unexpected popularity led to her rights ending up in the hands of Dynamite Entertainment, which is why even though Marvel recently got Conan back, they're now barred from using Red Sonya. Copyright disputes can cause wacky things. Just ask Shazam, or don't actually because that's a long story. Instead, take a look at Angela, the Divine Image Comics anti-hero who first appeared in Spawn No. 9 in 1993. Created by Neil Gaiman and Todd McFarlane, Angela was originally portrayed as an angel sent to kill Spawn who later discovered that her existence had been woven from the souls of sacrificed women. Angela proved to be a popular character, but she eventually got terminated by Malabolgia, at which point she was resurrected in… uh… the Marvel Universe? Yep, Angela is a Marvel character now. Newsarama reports that this was the result of a decade-long legal dispute between McFarlane and Gaiman which saw Gaiman taking the character's rights to Marvel. Given that Marvel has its own cosmic mythology, it's only natural that Angela's origins had to be a tad reworked, so she's now portrayed as the long-lost sister of Thor and Loki. In recent years, she has spent her time as a member of the Guardians of the Galaxy. Another Hasbro toy line, another Marvel comic, another super-confusing, reality-warping, canonical mind-screw. Much of the classic G.I. Joe lore that fans know today, you know, Duke, Snake Eyes, all that stuff, came courtesy of Marvel writer Larry Hama. While the G.I. Joe crew didn't usually get all that mixed up with the traditional Marvel heroes like Transformers did. That said, Duke did once pop up in an issue of The Amazing Spider-Man. More notably, Marvel claims credit for the first ever crossover between G.I. Joe and Transformers, a feat that IDW has since replicated. IDW's 2010 comic G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero does pick up the Larry Hama continuity but presumably eschews any Marvel connections. Commercial! I can't hear you when you're covered in rock! It doesn't hurt because it isn't real. Good job! One rather amusing anecdote about G.I. Joe is that many of Hama's story concepts were originally created for a different, unpublished comic. Titled Fury Force, according to comic book resources, the comic would have depicted Nick Fury's son leading an elite strike squad. Though Fury Force never saw the light of day, Hama repurposed these ideas to fit the G.I. Joe team. Considering that he went on to write the book for 12 years and over 150 issues, it seems like things worked out for the best. Yo! All other figures and Forget about that Drake crap in Blade Trinity. In the comics, Marvel's Dracula is the real Dracula, and he's the cloak-wearing, powerful, nightmarish supervillain you'd expect with a healthy blend of Bram Stoker's original concepts and Bela Lugosi's theatrics. Rather than guest starring in somebody else's book, the world's most infamous fanged supervillain hit the four colored pages in the 1972 comic Tomb of Dracula by Jerry Conway and Gene Colan. In the years that the great vampire actively menaced the Marvel world, he crossed paths with such notable heroes as Spider-Man, Doctor Strange, the X-Men, and Howard the Duck. The heroes who really stuck in Dracula's craw were people like Blade and Hannibal King, who both premiered within Tomb of Dracula's pages. Considering that Dracula is actually a classic Marvel villain, Blade Trinity had no excuse to portray him so poorly. Maybe the MCU will give him another chance someday? If nothing else, it's a good excuse to see more Howard the Duck. What do you let it lick you like that for? Gross. Yep, the X-Men and the Enterprise crew have encountered each other a few times. To be fair, though, the stories themselves acknowledge that both camps come from separate realities, which is kind of obvious, considering that there aren't any mutants enlisted in the United Federation of Planets. But just try to convince us that this interdimensional crossover isn't a part of both Marvel continuity and Star Trek continuity. Besides, it led to some iconic moments. The first time that Marvel's mutants appeared on the bridge of the Enterprise, for example, Spock took down Wolverine with a good old Vulcan nerve pinch. Luckily for Logan, he fared better when they journeyed to the era of Star Trek The Next Generation, where he was able to bond with the equally cranky Worf. The X-Men and Next Generation crew met a second time in an authorized 90s novel by Michael Jan Friedman, in which Data and Banshee sing duets, Geordi chills with Nightcrawler, and Captain Picard and Professor Xavier amuse themselves by remarking on their uncanny resemblance. Keep in mind, this book was published years BEFORE Patrick Stewart nabbed the latter role. Maybe somebody in Hollywood was taking notes? 
From TV to films and even video games, you really can't understate the influence that H.P. Lovecraft's cosmic horror stories have had on popular fiction, and the Marvel Universe is chock full of Lovecraftian terrors that would send shivers down your spine. Cthulhu himself is part of Marvel's dark, multi-dimensional pantheon, and while little is known about this particular incarnation of the great tentacled Elder God, he has occasionally appeared in darker titles like Moon Knight and Doctor Strange. He has never played a central role, though his children have. One X-Men story involving the Phoenix Force featured a ghastly monster called the Dweller in Darkness, portrayed as a spawn of Cthulhu who wanted to demolish reality. Do it for the old man, son. Other characters from Lovecraft's Cthulhu mythos, or references to them, have popped up in Marvel stories for decades. For example, Yog sothoth appeared in a number of Conan the Barbarian comics. Doctor Strange once even had a copy of the Necronomicon. Marvel's characters might be likable folks with relatable stories, but their universe certainly has some creepy corners. One of the craziest Marvel storylines in the 70s involved the giant, scaly mofo Godzilla himself busting free from an iceberg and stomping across the United States. On its way, the creature encountered such standard Marvel obstacles as S.H.I.E.L.D., the Avengers, and the Fantastic Four. Yep, you heard that right, Godzilla himself tussled with Marvel's heroes, and the results were just as bonkers as you'd hope. According to Sci-Fi, Marvel struck a deal with kaiju wizards at Toho to bring Godzilla to their pages, and since they couldn't afford to license any of Godzilla's usual monster opponents, they instead kept the beast preoccupied with superheroes like Iron Man, the Fantastic Four, and the Vision. Writer Doug Munch went pretty much all out in every issue, at one point having Hank Pym shrink Godzilla down to the size of a rat, and even including a scene where cranky old J. Jonah Jameson yells at Godzilla outside his window. Marvel eventually lost the big guy's comic rights, but, because the universe can be sorta rad sometimes, all of these stories have remained in continuity. What? Captain America's shield in the background of every episode wasn't a big enough clue? Reported on the tragic death of Captain America, I criticized him for dissenting with the Federal Superhero Registration Act. I just think if the government wants to track your every move, you should be flattered. It means they like you. Sure, Stephen Colbert is a real person, but the pompous, egomaniacal guy who hosted the Colbert Report was a fictional character, not at all like the real dude, and this fictionalized Colbert is actually a relatively major figure in the Marvel Universe. You see, Colbert ran as a third-party candidate for U.S. president in Marvel's version of the 2008 election, and he was immensely popular with the Marvel populace. Truthiness for the win! Colbert mostly appeared in various Spider-Man comics, at one point even getting tangled up in a fight with the Grizzly, a B-grade bad guy who wears a dumb teddy bear costume, which resulted in the web-slinger having to rescue him. Filled with the same self-importance as his TV character, Marvel's Colbert presumed that Grizzly must have been sent by the Red Skull or Kingpin as an assassination attempt. If TV Colbert and comics Colbert are the same, is every episode of The Colbert Report set in the Marvel Universe too? Timelines sure get confusing. Today we remember Joan of Arc mostly from novels and bad movies. We boil her down to this. Joan of Arc was a rare female military leader, she talked to God, she was burned at the stake, and she looked good in shiny armor. But there's a lot more to Joan of Arc than what you remember from your middle school history textbooks. That's not even her name. We call her Joan of Arc today, but that's not what she called herself. For starters, she was French, and Joan isn't a French name. Her given name was actually Joan, and she called herself Joan la Pucelle, or Joan the Maid. So the English translation of Joan is Joan, which is why we English speakers don't refer to her as Joan. So that makes sense, but what about Arc? Did Joan come from a town called Arc? Nope. According to the St. Joan Center, her father used that name. He was from a place called Arcanboa, hence the surname De Arc. And since modern people have a really hard time fathoming daughters who don't inherit their father's last names, we use Arc as Joan's last name too, even if she never did, having been born in a village called Doremi. Turns out Joan of Doremi just doesn't have that certain je ne sais quoi. Divine visions or schizophrenia? In Joan's day, hearing voices meant you were either talking to God or to the devil. And either way, it wasn't really great news for you. If you talked to the devil, you were a witch, which meant you'd get burned at the stake. If you talked to God, you were a very important person, which meant that eventually someone would decide you were actually talking to the devil, which meant you'd get burned at the stake. See how that works? Joan grew up devout, so when she started to hear voices, she truly believed she was talking to God, who'd chosen her for a great and noble purpose. But God may not have been behind those voices, 
issues. According to Live Science, at least two modern neurologists have posthumously diagnosed Joan with idiopathic partial epilepsy with auditory features, a genetic form of epilepsy that affects only one part of the brain and can cause auditory hallucinations. Other historians have speculated that Joan suffered from schizophrenia, which would also explain what she assumed was the voice of God. Her family wasn't poor. Joan of Arc is often portrayed as the definitive underdog, a peasant girl who became a great military leader and champion for France. That might make a great morale-boosting story to tell around the fire, but it's not quite the whole truth. According to author Ronald Gower, there's evidence that Joan's family was not actually poor. After her death, neighbors testified that her family owned land, specifically 20 acres, including farmland, meadow, and forest. They also had money stashed away for emergencies, which is a lot more than many modern families have. In fact, Joan's family doesn't appear to have been suffering at all. Their annual income was said to be the equivalent of roughly 200 pounds, which was kind of a lot of money in those days, or at least enough to live comfortably. More a figurehead than a soldier. We love to imagine Joan of Arc riding into battle at the head of her army, taking down English soldiers with one arm and praising God with the other. That's probably not exactly how it happened, though, depending on who you ask. Some of the people who knew Joan of Arc claimed she did all that, charged the British with a lance, and fought alongside her men. But not everyone thinks those accounts are accurate. Historian Desmond Seward, who wrote The Hundred Years' War, The English in France, said, Joan of Arc merely checked the English advance by reviving Dauphinist morale. Similarly, French historian Edouard Perroy basically said she was just a figurehead. She was content to exhort the combatants, say what advice her voices gave, step into the breach at critical moments, and rally the infantry. Which makes sense when you remember… she was basically a kid. Joan of Arc was a heroine, a leader, and an inspirational figure, so it's easy to forget that she was just a child when she accomplished all that she did. According to National Geographic, at the age of 16, she made the journey to Chinon to tell Charles of Valois, the son of the deceased King Charles VI, that God wanted her to help liberate France from its enemies. Unsurprisingly, people needed some convincing. Joan was sent away before meeting Charles, but she returned the following year, still hoping she could reach Charles and make him listen. He did listen, and then he gave her a suit of armor, a sword, and a horse, and sent her off to the front lines. The rest, as they say, is history, literally. Her clothing got her killed. When Joan of Arc was captured in 1430, the English charged her with a bunch of seriously lame crimes that we would never dream of charging anyone with today, including witchcraft, heresy, and cross-dressing. Then came a long trial that would have been humiliating except for the part where Joan was so well-spoken and clever that her inquisitors decided to make her public trial a private one because she was making them all look stupid. After that, Joan was forced to sign a document denying that her visions were real and agreeing not to wear men's clothing anymore. Because remember, that last bit was super important. According to mental floss, once her life imprisonment sentence was handed down, she went back to wearing men's clothing again. She told interrogators that she did so to better protect herself from harassment from the guards. She also told interrogators she wasn't being totally honest when she said she didn't really hear voices, and though that certainly contributed to her ultimate fate, it seems the cross-dressing was what set everyone off again. So then the bishop in charge decided she was a relapsed heretic, and she was sentenced to death by burning at the stake. If you look at a giraffe long enough, you'll start to suspect there's no way it could actually exist. With those long necks, spindly legs, and weird tongues, they look like they defy at least a couple laws of biology, and maybe even one or two from physics. But they do exist, and it turns out there's more weird stuff going on with them than you think. Here are some crazy facts you didn't know about giraffes. Giraffe Lullaby Giraffes sleep so little, it was once believed they didn't even sleep at all. In the 1990s, however, the University of Zurich spent 152 nights watching eight giraffes sleep and discovered they get their Zs in bursts ranging from 35 minutes to as little as one minute. Usually, they sleep standing, but sometimes they do lay down to get some much-needed REM sleep, curling up in a position that makes them look extra cute. So, what do they do at night instead of sleeping? Well, they hum. But they do it at such a low frequency, many people can't even hear it. The human hearing range runs from about 20 hertz up to about 20,000 hertz, with the giraffe's hum barely registering at frequencies as low as 35 hertz. Researchers have no idea why giraffes hum or if the sound has any meaning, but knowing that they do it sure is creepy. Those crazy necks. You've probably wondered why giraffes have such insanely long necks, and you're going to have to keep wondering because nobody actually knows. It was believed for a long time that giraffes evolved those huge necks so they could more easily graze on treetops. But it turns out they actually prefer eating from lower shrubs. 
which makes the neck a liability instead of a benefit. Some scientists now think those necks evolved because male giraffes get in violent necking fights to determine primacy. But that theory isn't widely believed either. So for now, it's a big mystery. One thing we know, it's not designed for urban travel. But because their necks are so long, giraffes have had to evolve special circulatory systems. The walls of their hearts are extra thick to deal with increased blood pressure, while a giraffe's blood vessels can expand and contract, and also contain valves to make sure the blood flows in the right direction even when they bend their huge necks. And they need it. A human exposed to the same kind of pressure change would pass out. Giraffes Through History Julius Caesar brought the very first giraffe to Europe in 46 BC, and according to contemporary records, the creature was so mellow it was walked like a dog on a leash. The Romans gave it the name Camelopardalus, because they thought it looked like half camel, half leopard. The fate of Caesar's giraffe wasn't recorded, but by the 2nd century AD, giraffes were being killed for sport in the gladiator arenas, because those people were monster jerks. Giraffes were treated a lot better in China after being brought to the country by an expedition in the year 1413. That's because the Chinese believed giraffes to be the mythical Qilin, a beast said to be part horse and part dragon, with one to three horns, a deer's body, an ox's tail, cloven hooves, and a gentle nature. So, you know, they weren't wrong. The Emperor Yunla even kept a giraffe around to legitimize his shaky claim on the throne because having a legendary mythical beast in your entourage is always dope, right? Giraffe Sex If you haven't spent much time thinking about giraffes having sex, well, we're about to change that. Unlike many animal species, giraffes don't have mating seasons. Instead, female giraffes are potentially fertile all year long. Male giraffes figure out whether or not their potential mate is fertile by tasting their pee. And if they can't find a mate, no problem, as male giraffes have been noted for their high rate of same-sex encounters. Once a female giraffe does get pregnant, though, it's a real process, as the gestation period can last up to 460 days, and birth takes place standing up, so babies are just dropped from a height of 6 feet. Pow! Welcome to the world, kid! One problem with giraffe sex, however, is that there are actually four subspecies of giraffes, and they only interbreed while in captivity. That's because weather differences put each species on a slightly different seasonal breeding cycle, so they're just not horny at the same time. That exclusivity has become an issue, as the giraffe population has declined by as much as 40% over the last 30 years due to, you guessed it, people killing them. It's estimated there are now fewer than 100,000 giraffes left in the wild. And the Rothschild's giraffe is on the endangered species list, with fewer than 700 left in the world. The White Giraffe in 2015, Wild Nature Institute reported seeing a newborn giraffe in the Terengiri National Park in Tanzania. She wasn't an ordinary giraffe, though. Thanks to a condition called leukism, her skin doesn't produce color, but other parts, like her eyes, still do. Tour guides named her Omo, and she's beaten some serious odds. She'd had about a 50-50 chance of seeing her six-month birthday, even as a regular boring old giraffe. And her awesomely unique appearance made those chances even worse, since she became a target for both human and animal predators. So when she was seen again in 2016, people were pretty excited. You go, little Omo. We're all rooting for you. Giraffes in Space In the 1980s, NASA was having problems with astronauts returning from space, as the increased gravity on Earth was pulling blood down to their lower extremities, leading to fainting and dizziness. Enter the giraffe. According to Mental Floss, a physiologist named Alan Hargens realized baby giraffes suffer through the same problems when they're born, and he and his colleagues studied their blood vessels as inspiration for creating the lower body negative pressure device. NASA also studied the circulatory system of adult giraffes to design spacesuits that could adapt better to different gravitational forces. To boldly go where no giraffe has gone before. When it comes to terrifying deep-sea creatures, octopuses are pretty intense. They're crafty, camouflaged, and incredibly intelligent hunters who can take on all kinds of different disguises. The ever-elusive octopus has also been known to change color, pattern, and shape, effectively transforming itself into seemingly meek sea creatures for the sake of deception. That means that any innocent-looking piece of rock or coral could actually be an octopus waiting to latch onto its prey. But you already know this. Release the Kraken! 
There is, however, one other thing that groups of octopuses have been known to come together and do from time to time, slink their way right out of the sea and onto dry land. In fact, there are some species of octopuses that can walk all along the sandy shoreline, propelling their spherical bodies forward with hundreds of tiny suckers on their tentacles, each doing the work of toes. This isn't a mishap or a navigational error, either. The walk is part of this maritime animal's hunting ritual. While one octopus hunting on the sandy banks of the shoreline is certainly noteworthy, though, how about 20? In a startling incident that took place on the Welsh coast, witnesses saw not one, not two, but dozens of octopuses walking right out of the ocean together. Some of them sadly didn't survive the journey, and their corpses were left behind on the shore as eerie evidence for this crazy ability. What makes this event so remarkable is the fact that scientists still don't know why it occurred, or if it can happen again. To add to the confusion, this particular type of octopus, which is called the curled octopus, is actually known for being somewhat antisocial. Spotting these solitary sea creatures in a pack is strange enough, but that goes doubly for spotting a whole pack of them walking on land. In response to the strange three-night ordeal, Julian Finn, the senior curator at Australia's Museum Victoria, told Scientific American, Many octopus species emerge to hunt in the pools of water left behind by the receding tide. He even hinted at the idea that this could be happening more often than we realize since so many species of octopuses are nocturnal. People were also startled this past August when a gigantic octopus began walking around on the shores of Byron Bay, Australia. He appeared to be alone, but made up for it by having tentacles at least a foot long protruding from his oblong body. Some rather brave spectators drew in for a closer look, and much to their surprise, the land-loving octopus began changing colors right before their eyes. Color changing is a relatively common kind of camouflage for octopuses and other sea creatures. In the case of cephalopods, it can sometimes signify feelings of disturbance or irritation. While there's no way to know whether the giant land-bound octopus began altering its hue out of anger, it does make this incident that much more intriguing. But here's a question. How should you react if you spot a massive octopus walking right out of the ocean? Well, if you said, I'd go out collecting octopus corpses, congratulations. You're kind of creepy, that's for sure, but you're also on the right side of science. Cephalopod expert Mandy Reed is urging locals in Wales to collect any corpses left behind after bizarre beach invasions. The thought behind this is that scientists might find clues of the cause in the now rotting bodies of beach-bound octopuses. We already know a little bit about how this is happening, though, and it has to do with how many octopus species can survive out of water due to special gas exchanges in their skin. This works as long as their skin remains damp. The bigger question here, though, is why is this happening? Theories abound regarding this new phenomenon of octopuses strolling beaches together in large groups. Everything from parasites to overfishing, from injuries to recent storms, has been considered. Perhaps the latest creepy collection of octopus corpses will reveal an unexpected cause. For now, though, we're left only with speculation. Hank Aaron is one of the greatest baseball players in history, famously breaking Babe Ruth's home run record. Mickey Mantle called him the best ball player of his era, and he's remembered as an icon on and off the field. This is the untold truth of Hammer and Hank Aaron. Henry Louis Aaron was born February 5, 1934, to Estrella and Herbert Aaron in Mobile, Alabama. Like many black children of the era, young Henry idolized Brooklyn Dodgers star Jackie Robinson, who broke baseball's color barrier when Aaron was 13 years old. Aaron told his father he would make the pros before Robinson retired. At 18 years old, Aaron dropped out of high school after being signed by the Indianapolis Clowns of the Negro American League. According to the Negro League's Baseball Museum, Aaron spent one season with the Clowns, making $200 a month and batting a league-best 467 average. Next, his contract was sold to the Braves, at that time still located in Boston, but soon to move to Milwaukee for $10,000. The Braves assigned Aaron to the Eau Claire Bears. In 1953, he became one of the first players to integrate the South Atlantic League. Playing in the South, Aaron faced a barrage of racist taunts from fans and players. In the first integrated game in Atlanta, Aaron hit a home run in the first inning, and fans attempted to hit Aaron with rocks, leading to the game being stopped. Still, Aaron won the Most Valuable Player Award in his only year in the minors. By 1954, Hammer and Hank would be a major leaguer. Before making it to the majors in 1954, according to author Ralph Wiley, Aaron hit a ball so hard that Boston Red Sox star outfielder Ted Williams ran out to the opposing clubhouse to see who had hit the ball. He didn't suspect that the culprit would be an unassuming player who had yet to make the majors. Despite his immense talent, Aaron's bat was the only thing that talked. Throughout his career, Aaron did not play in a major media market like Mickey Mantle, 
and his playing style wasn't known for being flashy like Willie Mays. Aaron himself said, I didn't do things with a flair by no stretch of the imagination. His quiet demeanor often led fans to overlook him throughout his career. Despite being consistently at or near the top of the home run list year after year, it wasn't until 1970 that people began to notice how close he was to the all-time record. The few times he did appear on the biggest stages, Aaron proved he had no equal. Yankees superstar Mickey Mantle looked at Hank Aaron as the greatest player of his generation. Mantle certainly isn't a minority in this assessment either, as Aaron's contemporaries were left in awe from watching him. They had plenty of compliments for him as they were interviewed following Aaron's selection for baseball's all-century team. Aaron, known for his steady consistency throughout his 23-year career, left some painful memories for pitchers who had to face him. Jack Mann of Newsday remembered a nickname Dodgers Hall of Fame pitchers Sandy Koufax and Don Drysdale gave to Aaron, Bad Henry. Koufax had this to say, For me, he was the toughest out. Everybody else, I had a plan. For Henry, I just never figured out what I was going to do. Pitchers employed different strategies to deal with Bad Henry. The brushback pitch, or a pitch thrown intentionally inside to intimidate a batter, was often used against Aaron. Fellow Hall of Fame pitcher Gaylord Perry recalled about the strategy, When you knocked Aaron down, you weren't doing yourself any good, because he got tougher. When one thinks of Hank Aaron, the first thing that comes to mind is breaking the all-time home run record held by Babe Ruth. Ruth's career record of 714 was so great that it was believed to be unbreakable. However, as the 1970s began and Aaron's consistent performance continued, many fans and outsiders in the sport made sure Aaron knew how they felt about a black man overtaking Babe Ruth. Aaron received thousands of pieces of hate mail, threatening him and his family if he kept on pace to break the home run record. On the 20th anniversary of breaking the record, Aaron spoke candidly about the experience to the New York Times. He recalled, My kids had to live like they were in prison because of kidnap threats, and I had to live like a pig in a slaughter camp. I was getting threatening letters every single day. All of these things have put a bad taste in my mouth, and it won't go away. They carved a piece of my heart away. Terrence Moore, a longtime sports journalist based in Atlanta, had this to say about the hate Aaron faced during his pursuit of the all-time home run record. It's a lot worse than we even know. Trust me, Hank doesn't like to talk about it. If people truly knew the story of what he endured and for him to go through it with dignity and still be productive, it's just astounding. After a long winter concluded, the 1974 season was set to begin with Aaron setting at 713 career home runs. One to tie, two to win. However, during this time, the commissioner of the MLB, Bowie Kuhn, and Aaron began to butt heads. Atlanta opened the season with a three-game road trip in Cincinnati, and Aaron and the Braves wanted the record to be broken at home in Atlanta. However, Commissioner Kuhn ordered Aaron to play in at least two of the road games. Aaron began the season by tying the record with a home run on April 4th, but he was fuming behind the scenes. Aaron had reportedly asked that there be a moment of silence in honor of the six-year anniversary of the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. His request was denied, with time constraints being blamed. Aaron actually sat the bench in Game 2 and then went homerless in the third game in Cincy, which meant he returned to Atlanta only one home run away from the record. In front of a celebrity-packed crowd and with millions watching on television, Aaron broke Babe's record. Missing from the celebration was Commissioner Kuhn, the commissioner citing scheduling conflicts for his absence. This, coupled with what he felt was unfair treatment of black players, led Aaron to resent Bowie Kuhn. In 1980, Aaron reportedly refused an award from his old rival in celebration of his record-breaking home run, criticizing the MLB's treatment of retired black players. In 1961, Yankee slugger Roger Maris broke Babe Ruth's single-season home run record by hitting 61 in a season. During the season, according to Newsday, the pressure led Maris to suffer from anxiety and hair loss. So imagine years instead of months chasing Ruth. In an interview looking back on the home run chase, Aaron called 1972 and 73 as two of the toughest years he had as a baseball player. Once I reached something like 650, I was way up in the 600. I thought that I had an outside chance, you know, if everything would fall in place. 
Then April 8, 1974 came. The attendance that night was 53,775 people, the highest in the park's history. Against the Los Angeles Dodgers, Aaron stepped to the plate in the fourth inning. His teammate, Dusty Baker, who was batting after Aaron, recalled Aaron saying, I'm tired of this. I'm going to get it over with. Being the veteran savvy player he was, the sequence went as predicted, and Aaron smacked the ball into the Atlanta Braves bullpen for number 715. Aaron waiting, the outfield deep and straight away. Fastball is a high drive into deep left center field. Buckner goes back to the fence. It is gone. As he was rounding second base and the crowd was exploding in a frenzy, two white fans ran onto the field. Aaron's wife, Billy, remembered being terrified for a moment at the sight of the two men following her husband. However, the fans simply patted Aaron on the back and congratulated him. Hank Aaron's home run record is commonly regarded as being his legacy in baseball, only surpassed 33 years later by Barry Bonds, with great controversy, as Bonds admitted to using performance-enhancing drugs during his pursuit of the record. It's kind of hard for me to digest and to come to realize that Barry cheated. But some of his other records remain untouched by other players. Baseball record books still show Hank holding the record for career runs batted in at 2,297, as well as the record for total bases at 6,856. Aside from that, Aaron was an elite defensive player. After spending his pre-professional career as an infielder, Aaron found a permanent spot in the outfield, which worked out as Aaron's infield abilities were not at a professional level. After a preseason game prior to being promoted, Dodgers outfielder Duke Snyder recalled about the minor leaguer Aaron. I don't think much of him as a second baseman, but the way he swings a bat, they're going to find a place to play him. Aaron played 2,174 of his over 3,000 games as a right fielder, according to Baseball Almanac, and won three Gold Glove awards, given to the best defensive player at a specific position. Unlike many other power hitters, Aaron's strikeouts remain very low, averaging only 68 strikeouts per season. By comparison, Barry Bonds and Babe Ruth averaged 83 and 86 per season. The late Tom Seaver said it best when describing Hammer and Hank. The thing that people should know about Henry is how good an all-around player he was. That's one of the most overlooked aspects of his career. Beyond the home run chase, Hank Aaron was on the front lines of civil rights during and after his career. Aaron was one of the baseball players in the early 1960s who pushed to desegregate spring training facilities in Florida. In 1966, the Milwaukee Braves became the first professional league to move to the Southeast, becoming the Atlanta Braves, right in the heart of the civil rights movement. Aaron entered the league only two years before Jackie Robinson's retirement. After idolizing Robinson as a teen, Aaron told Dan Patrick in an interview that he would talk to Robinson during and after games, learning from his hero. Still, the home run chase and the racism he endured during that time remains the greatest testament to Aaron's strength. After the 1973 season ended, with Aaron one home run shy of tying the record, he told reporters he feared he would not live to see the next season. Louis Grizzard, the sports editor of the Atlanta Journal, had privately written an obituary for Aaron on the all-too-real chance he would be killed before breaking Ruth's record. Aaron kept and occasionally read many racist letters he received, saying of them, they remind me not to be surprised or hurt. They remind me what people are really like. For a player and a man as great as Hank Aaron, it would be an injustice if his retirement in 1976 was the end of his time in the spotlight. With very little debate, Aaron was elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame in his first year of eligibility in 1982. Upon retirement, Aaron was hired by the Atlanta Braves as the Director of Player Development. He was the first African American to hold a senior-level management position in baseball. Aaron remained connected with the Braves organization throughout the rest of his life. According to ESPN, in 1999, the MLB announced that the best hitter in both the American and National League would receive the Hank Aaron Award. At the 2015 All-Star Game, Aaron, along with catcher Johnny Bench, outfielder Willie Mays, and pitcher Sandy Koufax, the man who referred to Aaron as Bad Henry, were honored as the four greatest living ballplayers. In 2002, President George W. Bush awarded Aaron with the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest honor one can give a civilian. In 2015, 
the National Portrait Gallery honored Aaron by making him one of their first five individuals selected for their gala. After years of being left out of honors and celebrations because of his quiet posture and the color of his skin, the twilight of Henry Aaron's life saw him properly celebrated for his accomplishment. Ask any rando on the street to name a weird fruit, and dollars to donuts, they will say banana. And that's just based on them being all yellow, bendy, and the favorite snack of all monkeys everywhere. But set aside its wacky appearance and the sheer danger of its peels in Mario Kart, and you might be amazed to find out that, when it comes to bananas, weird isn't skin deep. That's right, Britta. It's a banana. Why is there a banana in your DVD cabinet? Read the banana, Britta. You are a lying junkie. Potassium Power it's well known that bananas contain large amounts of potassium, good for all sorts of important bodily functions. What is less well known is that a small proportion of that potassium is the unstable radioactive isotope potassium-40. However, before you get any ideas about stuffing your face with bananas in pursuit of superpowers, be warned that it's next to impossible to get a significant dose of radiation from banana consumption. Using calculations based upon the so-called banana-equivalent dose, you would need to find room in your stomach for 10 million bananas in a single sitting in order to give yourself a lethal or superpower-inducing dose of radiation. On the off chance that you do attempt that mission, you're probably going to experience some significant and probably fatal non-radiation-related side effects long before you peel the last one, including a banana peel slip to end all banana peel slips. B-A-N-A-N-A-S Isopentyl acetate is an organic compound that can be found in bananas, in synthetic banana flavors, and also in the pheromones of bees. Bees and other insects rely heavily on pheromones to communicate, not to mention to do some pretty radical dancing. And when threatened, one of the messages they send with pheromones is attack. Isopentyl acetate is just one ingredient of the attack pheromone, but it is a pungent one, which is why after a bee stings, you'll often detect a banana-like smell around the wound. The chemical is strongest in fresh bananas, but fades as the fruit ripens. So if you just have to eat a banana around a bunch of bees, best to go for a brown one, or else. Oh, no, not the bees! Not the bees! Ah! Seeing Red You might freak out at the idea of a red banana, but they do exist. Red bananas are part of the Musa ecuminata species. Why don't we see all these fun bananas at the local grocery store? The answer is simple. According to the Washington Post, after decades of only seeing yellow bananas in our stores, many Americans aren't interested in non-yellow nanners. So how do red bananas taste? When they aren't ripe, they tend to taste very bitter with a starchy texture. If that's not what you're expecting, it can be an unpleasant shock. For a fruitier flavor, you'll want to make sure to grab a fully ripened red banana, which tends to be very sweet and creamy. Some actually compare the flavor to strawberry banana, while others note a hint of raspberry flavor. One in the same. Can you remember the first banana you ever ate? How about the most recent one? Well, you might be surprised to learn that, genetically, they were the same banana. That's because most of the bananas we eat in the West are known as Cavendish bananas, and they are all infertile, meaning you can't just plant a seed to get a new plant. Instead, you have to cut a piece from another plant and grow it separately. Those two plants and their fruit will be genetically identical. Clones are pretty cool, and they make for good science fiction, but in the case of bananas, there's a serious downside. Before the Cavendish became top banana, the Gros Michel was the banana boss. Unfortunately, a fungus came along and took a liking to the Gros Michel, wiping them all out. Eventually, the less creamy, less sweet, overall less satisfying Cavendish claimed its throne. And that's where we are now. Appealing Benefits Could it be that we love bananas not only because they taste delicious, but also because they make us feel good? Always take a banana to a party, Rose. Bananas are good. We couldn't agree more, Doc. According to Live Science, bananas can elevate your mood and help beat the snot out of depression. It's all thanks to high levels of tryptophan, which the body converts to serotonin, the mood-elevating brain neurotransmitter. If that's not awesome enough, the magnesium in bananas can relax muscles, while the vitamin B6 in them helps you get a good night's sleep. That's probably also thanks to the tryptophan, as anyone who overdid it at Thanksgiving can testify. Bananas for Bananas if you're watching this, it's probably safe to assume you like bananas. The average American eats roughly 25 pounds of them a year, which, depending on the size of the bananas you buy, means you could be eating as many as 100 bananas per year, which would work out to around two every week. 
Still, America doesn't even come close to the nation that eats the most nanners. That honor goes to Uganda, where they eat around 420 pounds of bananas per year on average. Ugandans eat so many bananas that their word for food, mutoke, is also the name of a common banana-based dish. Uganda is the largest producer of bananas in sub-Saharan Africa, so it's not really a surprise that they would eat a lot of what they grow. But to eat that many? They must be really, really bananas for bananas. Vikings were quite the travelers. From the 8th to 11th centuries, they journeyed throughout Europe, the North Atlantic, and to North America exploring, trading, and plundering villages along the way. And they did it all without GPS. So how did they do it? Part of their success came from the technology they used. For instance, as Davy Cooper of the Shetland Amenity Trust told the BBC, their ships were designed for speed, to carry the maximum number of men, and to go a fair way up river systems. He continued by adding, the shape of the boat meant it created bubbles on the edge of the planks. To all intents and purposes, a Viking ship rides on a cushion of air and has far less resistance in water. The Vikings built many types of boats, like their longboats used for raiding and warfare, with the front of them featuring a carved dragon, snake, or another fierce animal to intimidate their foes. They also had cargo vessels for trading, filled with items from their Scandinavian home, like furs, walrus ivory, and amber. All vessels moved either by the wind filling their sails or through the efforts of Vikings rowing. Other critical items aboard Viking ships were their weapons, which helped ensure success during wars and raids. Even though their bows and arrows, lances, spears, swords, and axes may have been primitive, they enabled them to be fierce fighters. They also adopted various protection devices like shields, helmets, and chainmail. And as a Viking, what you carry depended on your economic status. Axes and lances went to the less wealthy warriors, while sword carriers experienced lives of affluence. Few Viking helmets and chainmail survive today, so experts believe less of these were available and were possibly reserved for the more money Vikings. No matter why the Vikings traveled, whether it was warfare, exploration, trade, or plundering, they didn't use maps. They relied on natural means to find their destinations. They watched animals like birds and whales to help decide their direction, since these creatures were often only found in certain areas. The Vikings also used the sun, the moon, and landmarks to determine their path was correct. Dr. Anton Englar, who researched seafaring in the Viking Age at the Viking Ship Museum in Roskilde, Denmark, told Science Nordic, Back then, there were, of course, no compasses, echo sounders, satellite navigation, or radio communication. But the Vikings also had access to a special sun compass, which was really a circle with a pin in the center that they used to find locations based on the sun's position. This method proved less than perfect, as Davy Cooper explained to the BBC. They tended to get blown places accidentally, but they knew what direction to sail going back. That meant they could find the place again, and they could tell someone else how to find it. The exact design of this compass is unknown, but it is thought that it was used in conjunction with other objects such as a wooden slat. Allegedly, the mariners could use a combination of items to navigate the less than ideal conditions. A luminous mineral was also possibly combined with this simple sun compass. Davy Cooper explains to the BBC, they used a crystal that, when turned in a certain direction, it goes dark, and when it goes in another direction, it goes light. So, when turned to a light source, they discovered that it even worked in fog if they knew where the sun was, meaning they could figure out what direction they were traveling in. Some researchers believe one such sun compass, called the Unoktok disk, was discovered in Greenland. They believe a pair of crystals, also known as sunstones, could have created patterns that guided the Vikings up to 50 minutes past sunset. While Viking stories talk about such special crystals, no archaeological dig has ever discovered one, although History on the Net does point out that such an item was found in a shipwreck by the Channel Islands. The item was pegged as an Icelandic spar, but maybe it's the fabled sunstone? <laughs>